Hello, today we're going to talk about some specific cases uh, that relate to common law in various states or jurisdictions. Uh, the first thing is when fraud or gross negligence is present, um, we want the auditor to be found guilty. Uh, so this says when fraud or gross negligence is present, most jurisdiction expands the right of third party investors, even though they do not have privity of contract. Where fraud or gross negligence is present, we assume the auditor will be liable, held liable to third parties relying on the financial statements. I think that's what we want. Uh, we want to be part of a profession that has high standards. Uh, we understand people can make mistakes, but we don't want to allow fraud and gross negligence in our pro profession. So wherever fraud or gross negligence are present, we're going to assume the auditor will be liable to third party investors who relied on the financial statements. So we're trying to figure out to which third parties are we liable for ordinary negligence? So the question in this chapter is ordinary negligence. To which third party investors are we liable for ordinary negligence? Different jurisdictions, different states hold auditors liable to different classes of third parties. What are the three different classes of third parties? We've got primary beneficiary, foreseen users, and foreseeable users. The case Ultramaris and Credit Alliance discuss primary beneficiary. Rush Factors and the Restatement of Torts describe foreseen users, and Rosenblum does foreseeable. Here's an old, very out of date chart. But if you look at this chart, you can see that the vast majority of states follow rush factors, uh, second restatement of torts, which holds auditors liable to foreseen parties for ordinary negligence. Now, the primary beneficiary column looks kind of short, but keep in mind that you have Illinois, that's Chicago, that's a big player in the economy. You have New York, huge player in the economy. You have Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh are big players in the economy. So even though the, the list is short, uh, it's a very important group of states. Uh, Rosenblum, foresee foreseeable, uh, is Wisconsin and Mississippi. Uh, New Jersey no longer adheres to it, nor does California. Ultramaris, 1931. Now think for a minute about the time. 1931, we're in the, the meat of the Great Depression. Anything that creates jobs is good. Business is good by definition. Uh, we're trying to create jobs we're trying to get out of. Okay. In the Credit Alliance case, Judge Cordova said auditors should only be liable to the primary beneficiary for ordinary negligence. So auditors are liable to the primary beneficiary, but only to the primary beneficiary for ordinary negligence. Now, Judge Cordova's words have been influential over the years. If a liability for negligence exists, the failure to detect a theft or forgery under the cover of deceptive entries may expose accountants to a liability in an indeterminate amount for an indeterminate time to an indeterminate class. The hazards of business conducted on so, such terms are so extreme, nobody in their right mind would ever go into that business. But the indeterminate amount, the indeterminate time, and especially the indeterminate class have affected cases, uh, subsequent cases. This was New York. Ultramars was New York. Uh, New York is the only state where courts are required to look back to Ultramars for precedent. 1985. 
Credit Alliance versus Arthur Anderson. Uh, and it is a New York court, so they are required to look back to Ultramaris. They upheld Ultramaris and said auditors are liable to the primary beneficiary for ordinary negligence, but auditors are only liable to the primary beneficiary for ordinary negligence. What Credit Alliance contributed was what the heck is a primary beneficiary? And they said the accountant must be, have been aware that the financial reports would be used for a particular purpose. In furtherance of which a known party was intended to rely on those financial statements. And there's some kind of conduct on the part of the auditor linking them to that party. So there's three pieces to this puzzle, two big pieces, the financial statements, the auditor knew the financial statements were going to be used for a particular purpose, not just any purpose, a particular purpose. And further, which a known party was intended to rely. Uh, and there's some conduct where the auditor indicates that they knew that party was going to rely. Now, what does known party mean? A specific name, named party. So if I say we've got students at Cal Poly, students are not a known party. If I say Joan goes to Cal Poly, Joan is a known party. So it has to be a, a known party, a specific known party. This is New York. Now we're going to jump over to Rhode Island. Rush Factors, 1968. Has the world changed from 1931 to 1968? Yes. Uh, 1968, are we more concerned with individual rights than we were in 1931? Yes. Are we less concerned with corporate rights in 1968 than we were in 1931? Yes. And it says the auditor should be, so this is Rhode Island. Okay. The auditor should be liable for ordinary negligence in audits where the financial statements are relied on by actually foreseen and limited class of persons. I don't know what a foreseen and limited class of persons is, but I do know the limited classes is a response to Judge Cordoza in Ultramara saying indeterminate class of people. So they're trying to put a, a circle around this and say, well, it's not an indeterminate class of people. It's a limited class, whatever that means. Now, the judge in Rhode Island was not required to look at Ultramaris, which was a New York case. Obviously, from this ruling, the judge in Rhode Island did, in fact, look back at Ultramaris and responded to that indeterminate class of persons and said, let's put a circle around it and make it a limited class. Now, the second restatement of torts in 1977, nobody is bound to follow the second restatement of torts. It was a group of great legal minds who got together and, and basically wrote what the state of torts were in the United States in 1977. It is widely used. Lots of people look to it for guidance. And here they say, liable to a reasonably limited and identifiable group of users for ordinary negligence. What's that mean? Uh, liability is limited to the person or one of a limited group of persons for whose benefit the auditor knows the client intends to supply the financial statements. Uh, through reliance on the financial statements in a transaction for which the auditor knows the client intends to use the financial statements to influence the transaction or a substantially similar transaction. So we've got two things here. We've got a limited group of persons for whose benefit the auditor knows the audit client intends to supply. So. I'm still not there, but it's a limited group. The auditor knows the client is going to in, 
supply the financial statements to these people, this, these parties, and they know that the client is, intends for the financial statements to influence a transaction or a substantially similar transaction. So we've got a limited group of people, and also notice we've got a limited group of transactions. Um, the auditor must know the nature of the transaction or a substantially similar transaction. An auditor is liable for negligence to a third party only if they intend to supply the information the benefit of one or more third parties I'm still struggling with that for a specific transaction or a specific type of transaction identified to the supplier. Then they give some examples which help me a little bit. Uh, they say an auditor engaged to perform an audit and render a report to a third person whom the auditor is considering a $10 million investment in the client's business is on notice of that specific liability and it may take actions to limit or avoid their risk. So the auditor's engaged, the auditor knows this third party is considering making a $10 million investment and therefore the auditor can take actions to mitigate that risk. In contrast, an auditor who is simply asked for a generic audit uh, has no comparable notice. I don't like this, but nobody asked me. So it seems to me saying that, gosh, if I'm at risk of losing $10 million, I should do a better audit than if I'm just doing a generic audit. I think we should always get a, do a good audit. Maybe I'm not realistic. Uh, the second restatement of tort says, oh, look, if the auditor is doing a generic audit, they have no information, no notice about what the risk might be and therefore they can't respond to it. If the auditor knows a third party investor is going to make a $10 million investment, then the auditor can take steps to mitigate or limit their risk. Similarly, there's no liability when the client's transaction changes and materially in increases the auditor's risk. A third person originally considers selling goods to a client on credit. So they're using the financial statements, the audited financial statements, to extend credit to the audit client. Okay. So the audit client can buy supplies from them. Later, the third party investor buys a controlling interest in the client's stock based on their reliance on the audited financial statements. And the auditor would not be liable for the stock purchase because this is not a similar transaction. Remember, there's two parts to this. Uh, one is a limited class. And the auditor knows who that limited class of investors is. And the second is transaction. The auditor is aware of what type of transaction the financial statements are being used for. If the type of transaction changes, uh, the auditor's liability goes away. The auditor may be held liable to a third party lender if the auditor is informed by the client that the audit will be used to obtain a $50,000 loan, even if the specific lender remains unnamed or the client names one lender and then borrows from another. So, if, if the client says, I'm going to go get a $50,000 loan from a bank, then banks are a limited class. If the client says, I'm going to get a $50,000 loan from First National Bank, and then they go ahead and get a $50,000 loan from Third National Bank, the auditor is still liable because banks become a limited class and third bank is a member of that limited class. Under the restatement of torts, an auditor retained to conduct an audit to furnish an opinion for no particular purpose generally undertakes no duty to third party investors. 
The client uses the financial statements to obtain a loan from a bank. Because of negligence, the auditor issues an unmodified opinion, even though the balance sheet materially misstates the financial position. Because of reliance on the financial statements, the bank suffers a loss. In the context of the second restatement of torts, if the auditor was told the financial statements were being done for no particular purpose, or that it was just a generic audit, the auditor is probably not liable to the bank. The third group of third party investors are foreseeable users. And that is in New Jersey, Rosenblum said the auditor should be liable to foreseeable users for ordinary negligence. Um, that is anybody the auditor could have possibly foresee foreseeable is foreseeable for the auditor to assume might use it. So wherever I got the financial statements, for whatever purpose I used them, uh, if I base my decision on the audited financial statements, the auditor is probably going to be liable to me as a foreseeable user in New Jersey. Thank you, and there's more to come.